For the eighth session of our um, conference, I would like to invite research assistant Murat Öğütçü and the chairperson per associate professor Dr. Um, Arturul Koç. Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I introduce the speaker of this session, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference. The academic papers presented so far have contributed a lot indeed to our insights on Shakespeare and his works. All right, the speaker of this session is Murat Öğütçü. Uh, a young and prolific academic from Hacettepe University. Uh, Mr. Öğütçü completed his primary and secondary education in Augsburg. I am right? Yes. yes. Okay, Germany. He received his BA degree from Gaziantep University, Department of English Language and Literature in 2008. Currently, he is a research assistant at Hacettepe University, a Department of English Language and Literature. Uh, and he is writing his PhD dissertation on Shakespeare's history plays. Uh, from August 2012 to January 2013, he was a visiting scholar at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has presented several papers in conferences and has written book chapters and articles on his research interests that include early modern studies, Shakespeare and cultural studies. Uh, the title of his speech is Shakespeare in Animation. I think an interesting subject that will attract the attention of all. Yes, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for, for our professors for encouraging us to be part of this wonderful conference. I will go to this side. Uh, as, it was, uh, as it was called, uh, I will talk about Shakespeare in animation. Uh, Shakespeare's works have been used throughout a variety of media, uh, both for the edification of people and enlarging the commercial big market surrounding him, which contribute to the preeminence of Shakespeare in the consciousness of people. Although animations have been yet another important media, they have been overshadowed by, by their more serious counterparts in movie adaptations which is why there is no substantial work on the history of Shakespeare in animation. Only some references are given as part of adaptation studies, mostly in negative way, which criticize animations as reductive kitsch of low culture and as apocalyptic because they abbreviate the original text and seem to substitute and thus triumph over high culture, as uh, Brown, Seaton, Hawkes, Osborne, and Corson claim. Nevertheless, the problem with literary-minded critics is that they think that students should be protected from incorrect signification. Concepts about memory, loss, and reconstruction in the mind are not considered in analyzing Shakespeare in animation, although they stimulate creativity. Therefore, sorry, uh, therefore, uh, this paper will analyze how animation reflected Shakespeare's legacy in parodies, recreations, and straightforward adaptations, especially to references to Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, and Macbeth. As for my methods, I have used the Big Cartoon Database, the British Film Institute, the American Film Institute, and the Internet Movie Database to collect my data. And as for my working definition, uh, there is an ongoing debate, debate whether puppeteering is a form of animation or not, but I will not 
use animation in the limited sense and uh, include both frame animation and puppeteering as forms of animation because they give lifelike qualities to inanimate objects. To start with, parody is a literary device that uses subversion for comic effect, uh, where the level of appreciation is determined by the amount of knowledge of the original. Yet even without foreknowledge, the situation and verbal comedy may create laughter. Thus, even though critics consider parodies as bastardizations, they are far more successful to catch at least momentarily audience attention. The exposures of Shakespearean references accumulate so that he remains in the consciousness of people, which not just subvert but also promote him. In particular, there are two types of parodies in title and in the form and content. Sorry. In the first one, uh, only the title refers to a Shakespearean work, almost without any other relation, such as Duffy Duck to Duck or Not to Duck, <laughs> Casper's to Boo or Not to Boo, uh, Rotterdam's to Beep or Not to Beep, Popeye's Rodeo Romeo, Pepe Le Pew's Sentimental Romeo, Bugs Bunny's Rabbit Romeo, The Flintstones' Dino and Juliet, The Smurfs' Romeo and Smurfette, and The Simpsons' Romeo Old and Juliet A are among those animations which use puns on the titles where Romeo may stand for any romance relationship, whereas the others may reflect to any conflict situation. Uh, the second type of parody relates to subversions of form and content where Dyer's burlesque series were the forerunners of their uh, kind. Uh, unfortunately, only Ophelia and a part of Othello have survived, whereas for the others we have reviews. For instance, Dyer's Romeo and Juliet, which featured cartoon versions of Chaplin, uh, Charlie Chaplin as Romeo and Mary Pickford as Juliet, with a happy ending, started a tradition of Romeo's, comic Romeos in animation. Here, uh, rivals substitute the family feud as antagonistic force and try to attract their Juliet. Felix the Cat's Romeo and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit's rival Romeos depicted Romeo serenading for a Juliet. While Felix succeeds, in Oswald a third Romeo appears with whom Juliet elopes. Likewise, Popeye's Shakespearean spinach depicts a love triangle where the antagonism starts with the substitution of Bluto with Popeye as Romeo in a Broadway musical, and Bluto's efforts to molest Olivia and beat Popeye. First, Bluto takes over Romeo's role, and then Popeye takes over the role of Juliet. This cross-dressing creates a dichotomy between Shakespearean diction and physical comedy, seen when Bluto as Romeo flings Popeye on the floor but assumes to be shocked to see his Juliet unconscious. Yet interestingly enough, the farcical final beating of Bluto creates excitement in the theater audience, as you may see, who has been silent throughout the original performance. Similarly, Drupio and Juliet shows how Drupio and his rival MacWolf contest for the hand of Juliet. Drupio wins all contests, as seen in the final scene, because he sits at the lap of Shakespeare and has been writing the whole episode. Consequently, while the rival Romeo tradition subverts Shakespeare's Romeo to depict a love triangle, it also sustains the interest in Shakespeare's works through several animations in different periods. Besides, early Warner Brothers cartoons created yet another tradition that used pastiche and would dominate parodic animations of Shakespeare. For example, Bugs Bunny's A Witch's Tangled Hair comically alludes to Shakespeare's writing process, seen when he writes Macbeth after he reads it on a post box. In the main plot where Hazel the Witch tries to catch Bugs Bunny for lunch, several references to Shakespeare's work create laughter, seen when Bugs Bunny tries to distract Hazel by wooing her as Juliet. Likewise, The Muppet Show, in many episodes, uses wordplay and refers to Shakespeare in a light way, seen when Kermit the Frog in a panel asks if William Shakespeare was in fact bacon, which however offends Miss Piggy about bad jokes on pigs and bacon. In the, in the sense of pigs. Similarly, the Tiny Toons, which depicts Bob's Bunny's struggle to prove Shakespeare that she is a great actress through parodic depictions of his plays like Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth, 
Toy Story 3 where Mr. Prickle Pants and one of the little green men performed the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, and SpongeBob's episode where he's attacked by Romeo and Juliet robots in a tunnel of love are further examples of pastiche. Yet, pastiche is also used to create criticism, to target criticism to the failings in the pedagogical function of Shakespeare, such as to the possible dullness of traditional productions as in South Park, as you may see on the audience. Uh, the emphasis on the written text and the memorization of well-known phrases just to show off in American Dad, and the limits of memorization seen in Family Guy when Peter alludes to Duncan being betrayed by Lady Macbeth and creates an amalgam of Star Wars, Macbeth, and the bear from the Winter's Tale, as you may see. Furthermore, there have been some parodies that remake Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays, mostly selecting some of the most important scenes and bending the original plot line to characteristics of certain characters or a recurrent plot outline. For instance, Johnny Bravo's Johnny O. Juliet shows the mock heroic feud of Johnny's mother with her new neighbor and the neighbor's daughter, Julie's rejection of Johnny. Moreover, Melancholy Brain, where almost all other characters look like those from Zephyrelli's Hamlet, refers almost to the entire play in a condensed way. In the mock heroic remake, the brain's efforts to conquer Denmark by leading to a fallout between Claudius and Hamlet turns out to be a rehearsal of a proto-Hamlet and the mice's efforts to take over the Globe Theater. In The Simpsons, however, a burlesque of Hamlet is presented in a frame tale where uh, Homer reads from Hamlet. And now you must avenge me! Avenge me! How? I don't know. Surprise me! Surprise me! <laughs> Apart from equating the storyline to the movie Ghostbusters, first by making old Hamlet, that is Homer, disappear from walls and leaving a slime, just like Slimer in the movie, and second by Homer's assertion that the play also became a great film, Ghostbusters, colloquialism is used to parody the original play seen finally in Hamlet's accidental death by slipping on the, quote, bloody floor, unquote, and Gertrude's housewife mo motive in committing suicide not to, quote, clean up this mess, unquote. However, such burlesque is abundant in the segment Lady Macbeth, marked by mock heroic seriousness, where Macbeth turns to a hand-packed husband who has not a good job and is incited by his wife to take over the position of his rivals. In the frame day, in, in the frame tale, Marsh bewails her condition to be the wife of Homer, who is not playing a good role, and he's just playing the tree in Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth is played by Krusty's sidekick, Sideshow Mel. Marsh incites Homer to kill Mel to get his role, which he achieves. Yet Homer is such a poor actor who constantly forgets his lines and gets bad reviews. Marsh's insistence on improving her husband's career for self-satisfaction is as serious as in Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth. In last night's Macbeth, the best performance was Barney Gumble as Duncan, followed by Duffman as Macduff, Lenny Leonard as Lennox, Eddie and Lou as the two soldiers without lines, then last and least, the lead, Homer Simpson. Why do they write a new review of this play every single day? All I heard was more names of actors you haven't killed, unless you're not man enough. No, dear, I'm a man, dear. When Homer is the last to survive and nobody is around, he plays very well, and the ghost of Marsh wants him to play all of the lead roles in Shakespeare. Yet Homer com commits suicide, as for him, reading all these plays would be the real tragedy, which is in accordance with the mock heroic situation created through the fusion of high culture, Shakespeare's work, and the popular culture, the stereotypes of American working class Homer embodies. Apart from such parodies, there are recreations of Shakespeare in animation where either the superstructure is altered, yet the infrastructure remains almost the same, or missing parts of a story are tried to be filled by artistic imagination. As for the first, the story of Romeo and Juliet is used to depict the destructive force of hatred and the connective force of uh, love in comic or tragic endings. In Romeo and Juliet, and Astro Boy's Robio and Robietta, robots capable of human feelings replace and contrast insensitive humans. Likewise, seals, dogs, 
and garden gnomes replace humans and tell the same story again.